Hello, part four of emotions. We're going to look at two different types of emotions. There's lots of different types. We're going to look at two a little bit more in depth, fear and happiness, and just get a little bit more understanding about those. All, all types of emotion kind of have, have the same ideas behind them um, that we're going to talk about here. And you can take a lot of the ideas we have here and just place them with other types of emotions. So fear um, can be poisonous, right? Fear can... Um, you know, put you in straps and not allow you to do things in your life. Um, fear can be contagious, right? If you're fearful, somebody near you might be fearful, right? Um, my, you know, some of my children, right, they'll look like to each other sometimes if there, something's happening to see how the other one's responding to see whether or not they should be afraid or not, right? So the three-year-old or four-year-old might look up to the six-year-old and go, how is he responding to this? Should I be fearful of this? Should I be afraid or not? And then, um, more often than not, fear is also adaptive. It's like an alarm system. Alarm system. Come on. Alarm. There we go. System. And it prepares your body to flee danger. So fear is kind of just like getting you ready. It's like sounding the alarm and then your sympathetic nervous system is going to start kicking into gear. I think about fear that's, you know, interesting is that we can... We learn a lot of our fears. We learn to be afraid of different things, right? So one of my I, my three boys, one of my boys was around our dogs. So we've, they've, we've been dogs around all of them, but one of them didn't play as much with the dogs when they were little, really little. And so he's more fearful of the dogs than the uh, my, my youngest, who's around, who's just for coincidence, or I, I don't really know why, has been around the dogs more and played outside with them more. And so the little one's not afraid of them at all, the one-year-old. And the four-year-old now, he's probably the most uh, fearful of the dogs. We have a, a big boxer. And, um, and that's just based off of fear for learning, right? He's had the experiences and, and associations, whereas the bigger one has only seen things on TV, and he's already become fearful and whatnot of it. Um, remember that we, you know, with this learning, when we, from your learning chapter, we learn things and we associate them with right through operant a lot of times conditioning. So an example of that, right? Remember the baby Albert, the little Albert experiment. The baby played around with the, with the bunny and then um, they would take the bunny and then they pair it with a really loud crashing sound. And then the baby, every time he saw the bunny would start to freak out and cry because he was it was conditioned when he saw the bunny that he was going to be fearful because he didn't have that loud sound, right? And so we can learn these fears from that. Um, fear is also, there's also some biology to go along with it. Um, number one, the amygdala plays a key role in your fear, right? We've talked about that before. Um, so your amygdala is uh, in your limbic system, right? At the end of your hippocampus, right? And it's going back and forth from your thalamus, and sometimes there's a shorter center. I think we'll talk about that next unit um, or next part and talk about how it, uh, you know, there's a short route and a, a long route to get to your amygdala with, with emotions. But also interesting is uh, genes, right? Your genes can also play a role. Um, in twin studies, it's been shown that, that there's a short version of a particular gene that has less of a protein that speeds the reuptake of serotonin and when serotonin is uh, floating around it can activate the amygdala more easily so what happens is there's this you have a particular gene and because it's shorter right here's a normal gene uh, which it's got a certain amount of protein in it right and so this one's shorter so it has less protein and so when serotonin is released right at the end of the terminal branch, uh, gets released into the synaptic gap, and then right after it's in there for a while, it gets sucked back in, reuptake. Well, this one's able to, these proteins are helping suck it back in. Since there's only two proteins here, it's not able to suck it back in quite as quickly, which leaves the serotonin out there. And serotonin is right, definitely one of your emotional drugs or emotional neurotransmitters, and that helps activate the amygdala. And when the amygdala gets activated, right, remember, like we talked about last period, how you interpret these certain things, and so it can all be played together. <clears throat> so there you go with fear. Um, let's talk about a little bit about happiness. Um, first of all, well-being 
So your well-being, your like just general level of happiness, um, is assessed as either a feeling of happiness, uh, either it's sometimes defined as your ratio of you know high uh, positive events to low uh, negative events, and that equals whatever comes out here. That's going to be your well-being. So if you've had you know. 16 positive events and 12 negative events, you're gonna have a plus four, so you're gonna feel a well-being, right? If you have a plus 20, you're gonna feel your well-being's gonna be even higher than that. That's one definition of well-being. Or another uh, definition is just your uh, satisfaction with life. Just your general satisfaction with life. So those are two definitions, satisfaction with life or then your cumulative sum of positive and negative events added together. Um, something about your well-being is that, um, interestingly enough, everybody talks about, uh, you know, especially if you're in school right now, you're talking about, you think about how much money you want to make when you get older. And percentage of happiness, right, look in the, in the years here. So we have different years, 2005, um, people describing themselves as very happy. So um, as you can see, as personal income rises, your happiness doesn't rise along with it. So as your income goes higher and higher and higher, your happiness stays pretty flat line. It's actually going down since the 50s, right? 50s were a little bit higher here. We're closer to 40, 35%. Now we're closer to like 31, 32% here. So income's rising, but your happiness level is staying uh, the same. So there's not, uh, from research, a, a direct comparison with the amount of money. The, kind of the idea is if you have enough money, the research shows if you have enough money to be buy things, to go to a restaurant when you want to go to a restaurant, to buy a car that's not going to break down, and to have a house over your head in the United States, you're going to be happy. Kind of the, the top is somewhere around $200,000. If you make $200,000, between two hundred two hundred fifty, like that's like the maximum amount where happiness doesn't go any higher. Because if you're making $250,000 a year, you can pretty much go out to eat whenever you feel like it, and you pretty much buy any car you want, and you're not gonna go broke. You can't spend frivolously, but you can buy any you can buy anything that you want. When you get millions of dollars, you can still buy all that stuff, you can just buy more of it. But is more stuff gonna make you happy, right? It's other things in life that are gonna make you happy. Um, a couple of slides, I'll show you some ways to make yourself happy. Um, and then kind of looking here, it's kind of interesting. Percentage rating goal is very important or essential. And so, you know, right about in the 70s here in the United States, being financially well off uh, started to beat out um, developing a meaningful life philosophy as, you know, the number one goal in life. So today, 70% uh, say what's going to make me happiest is being financially well off. Whereas uh, before 1978 or so, it was uh, de developing a meaningful life philosophy so having a, just a good life and so you know this is something you should you should keep in mind here is that uh, with this personal income as we've seen that you know money can't buy happiness money buys money can give you opportunities but money doesn't buy you happiness and then here you know how our societies kind of change we become more materialistic society um, so when we compare happiness right some, some sometimes we we're, we base our happiness off comparing off other people or other situations um, so the adaptation level phenomenon is we judge our various stimuli relative to those we have previously experienced. So if I'm in a particular, if I have a particular house, so you take a rich person who grew up rich and then all of a sudden now they're living in, so they grew up in this mansion, 30,000 foot, so say they have this 30,000 foot mansion, right? Enormous, too big for anybody to even live in. Um, and now they're, they're, they're living a, a modestly sized 3,000 foot, right? Modestly, that's still a bit really big. So they live in a 3,000 foot home, right? Um, this person, adaptation level phenomenon, I would say the rich person in this situation is probably not going to be as happy, right? They're not going to be as happy because they went from 30,000 to 3,000. So they compare it to basically what they've actually done. Whereas you have somebody who's lived in a one room shack their entire lives, and now they live in this 3,000 foot home, they're gonna be a lot happier, aren't they? If you just think about it that way, they're gonna be a lot happier. And so that, the reason why that person's gonna be a lot happier is because you're comparing it to something that you already know. 
um, you know, kind of a sad thing is that the kids in the concentration camps during Nazi, uh, in Nazi Germany during World War II, the kids didn't know any better. They were going through these horrific conditions, but they, because they were so young, because their memories weren't formed yet, right? Remember, when you, as you're young, you don't have the neural connections to, to form these long-term memories. They didn't know that they were living a horrible life. They knew that they were hungry all the time. They knew that, you know, they were working. They saw deaths all the time. They didn't know, have anything to compare it to. That was just life. Whereas the adults were the ones who were much unhappier than the kids because they had a life outside of that. Um, and then finally, we have this thing called relative deprivation. I don't know if you guys can hear my son crying in the ba background out there. He's a little bit upset about something. Um, relative deprivation, deprivation means that we compare ourselves to others, and it works both ways. Um, we can compare ourselves upwardly to people that are happier than us, and we can compare ourselves downwardly to people that are less happy than us. And so we usually feel better about ourselves when we're above others, right? So we feel we feel better if um, you know if ten people are down here and we're up here, you know we're gonna feel better about our lot in life. Um, so relative deprivation is you know relative to others, are how deprived are we or how deprived are they of our situation? You know because we want to always be better than everything. We just have this natural tendency to do that, um, and we don't want to you know. Whereas you can find better true happiness if you're just happy with what you've got. Um, so some ways to be happy. Here are 10 different ways I, I wrote down real quick. Uh, realize that enduring happiness, and this is based off of um, Myers and his 10 ways to, to be happy. Realize that enduring happiness may not come from financial success, right? We just mentioned that. Take control of your time. An often overlooked part of happiness is people who have more control of their time are able to do things when they want to do them are happier. Um, act happy. We talked about smiling more makes you happy. Sorry. All right, that crisis was avoided. So act happy, smile more, you're actually going to be happier. Um, seek work and leisure that engage your skills. Um, if you feel like you're making a positive impact on something, you're happier. Um, join the movement movement. People who exercise and feel fit are happier. And this is all based off research, right? Give your body the sleep that it wants. Sleep is an enormously essential thing to be happy. Um, priority close relationships. Building relationships. We're a, a relationship people. We like relationships. Focus beyond yourself. Be altruistic. Count your blessings. Record your gratitude. When we talk about that relative deprivation, you probably have more positive things happening, happening to you than you're remembering. Remember, we tend to remember negative events or abnormalities more easily than um, things that continue to happen. And then finally, nurture your spiritual self. Um, whatever your, sp your spiritual self might be, it doesn't, research shows it doesn't matter what you choose, it's just to get in touch with something spiritual will help make you happier. And there you go for uh, how to get happy and uh, types of emotions. Thank you.